Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. Paris Schutz has the evening off. On the show tonight, we're still behind the national average. Chicago is trying to get new ways to get COVID shots into the arms of people reluctant to be vaccinated. A contentious proposal to rename Lakeshore Drive heads to city council. Again, we talk with older people about that and other city business. After record floods in 2019, Northern Illinois farmers are now contending with severe drought after the third driest spring on record. A mass ex exodus of talent at the Chicago Tribune will talk with four columnists who are taking buyouts. The, the goal is to do a rubbing of the building. It was really to mark time. How an artist is using graphite to document the impact of one of the city's most prominent cultural institutions. So you have no uh, idea who public official lady. I don't know who ABC is. D or X's. And as we get set for our colleague Phil Ponce's retirement at the end of the month, we have the first in a series of Ponce moments, like this memorable conversation with then Governor Rod Blagojevich. But first, some of today's top stories. The last day of the school year for Chicago Public School students. Mayor Lori Lightfoot made a visit to South Loop Elementary School to mark the day. It's the end of a disrupted year that saw COVID safety protocols and a mix of remote and in-person learning. It's also the final school year for school CEO Janice Jackson, who's leaving when her contract expires next week. More cleanup today from the suburban storms that included what's now been confirmed as two tornadoes. As residents and businesses assess the damage, Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul is warning against fraudsters who swoop in after disasters. In a statement, Raoul says, quote, we have too often seen scammers take advantage of the devastation caused by tornadoes or other natural disasters and use it as an opportunity to line their own pockets. People should be wary of any individual who solicits home repair or insurance adjusting services door to door. And we have more of Sunday's storms and advice from the AG on protecting yourself against scams on our website. Community organizations and older people pressure the mayor to adopt a progressive plan for federal COVID relief money. At a news conference this morning, advocates pitched the so-called Chicago Rescue Plan. It calls for funding an array of priorities, including violence prevention, child care access, and crisis support, including reopening shuttered city mental health clinics. What happened to those clients? Who asked them, you know, where do you go? Now that your clinics are closed, where do you go? We've lost some people because of the closing of these mental health clinics. We've lost them. And so how do we help those who are being traumatized in their neighborhoods now? And also speaking in favor of the proposal were some of the older people co-sponsoring it. We'll hear from a panel of city council members shortly. Public health officials say the coronavirus vaccine is the best hope for putting an end to the pandemic. Because even though Illinois has reopened, COVID is still here. Amanda Venicky joins us now with the latest on how public health departments are trying to get shots into the arms of people who are reluctant. Amanda, what is the status of COVID vaccinations at this point? Brandis, first let's take a step back. Remember, there was a time that demand for the COVID outseen far outpaced supply. Recall that people were clamoring, traveling, staying up all night, pressing refresh on their computer to try to get a COVID vaccine appointment. We are no longer at that point. Demand for the COVID vaccine has dropped in Illinois. In April, there were days that topped 174,000. Lately, less than 17,000 doses have been administered a day. In Illinois, nearly 55% of the adult population, so those over 18, has been vaccinated so far. Nearly 48% of Chicago residents have had the shot. And here's a national check-in. We have already met the president's 70% goal for all U.S. adults 30 and older. That's right, for those ages 30 and above, 70% have at least one shot. President Joe Biden had wanted 70% of Americans at least partially vaccinated by the 4th of July. The White House today acknowledged the U.S. will miss that goal by a couple of weeks, likely, citing reluctance, particularly by those in the 18 to 26 age group. 
new incentives to get the vaccine. Starting today, Walgreens giving $25 in Walgreens cash, so that's basically a gift certificate you can use at its stores for anyone who gets vaccinated at Walgreens. Music lovers and youth may be particularly interested in an event that Chicago has planned for Saturday. You have to pre-book an appointment to get the vaccine at one of four locations, they're actually city colleges, that you'll then in exchange get a pass to go to one day of Lollapalooza. If you want to book, Dr. Ellison already says those appointments are going quickly and watch what location you make an appointment for because they are matched with what day for the music festival the pass is for. Now there's also that big state lottery featuring prizes of up to a million bucks for anyone who's received the vaccine. All Illinoisans, regardless of immigration status, are automatically entered. Adults for cash prizes use ages 12 to 17 for a scholarship. That first drawing, July 8th, you have to have gotten vaccinated by the start of July in order to be eligible for it. But then there are going to be drawings throughout July and August and the state will check before each round. So anybody who gets vaccinated throughout the summer will be eligible for ladder drawings. Chicago's public health commissioner says the city purposely waited to use these major incentives for later to drive interest. I think anything that keeps people talking about vaccine uh, is a good thing. Um, we know that we are working a lot harder to get every vaccination at this point uh, than we were previously. And we also know a lot of people are tired of talking about COVID uh, and perhaps not as, uh, you know, it's not as much front and center in terms of what people are thinking about. Chicago announced a new incentive today. Now, previously, the city would send a team to homes of seniors or to those with disabilities as a way for those who have a hard time getting out and about to be able to get vaccinated. Now, that will be an option for anyone at home visits, regardless of age or status. Books up and starting next week, get a $50 Grubhub gift card. One per household, when you sign up for at-home vaccination, again, that can be up to 10 people in your household, uh, you will receive a $50 gift card from Grubhub. That can be used immediately at any location where Grubhub is available. So if you make it a family event to get the vaccine, you can also order in food uh, and have dinner as a result. Already says Chicago has made progress on vaccinations, but the city is not where she wants it to be. And the vaccines work, including for older people. Since mid-January, 97% of the COVID hospitalizations in Chicago and 98% of the COVID deaths in Chicago have been in people who were not fully vaccinated. Because while things may be starting to feel like they're back to normal, COVID is still a threat. Already says that Chicago has not seen a day since last September when somebody in the city has not died of COVID. Lately, she says the average is two people a day in Chicago dying after having contracted COVID-19. And then there's this added new concern of that Delta variation. I fully expect this, this virus to continue to evolve. Right now, if you are exposed to COVID in Chicago, you're more likely to be exposed to a variant than you were previously, meaning you're actually more likely to get COVID if you're exposed to someone who has COVID. It's just that we have less COVID around, and so broadly the numbers are lower. Already says thus far, Chicago has seen 70 cases of that Delta mutation. Now, individuals, social networks, and neighborhoods where people are not vaccinated are most threatened, she says. That is a sentiment that is echoed by America's most famous physician, Dr. Fauci. But there is a danger, a real danger, that if there is a persistence of a recalcitrance to getting vaccinated, that you could see localized surges, which is the reason why I want to emphasize what all four of us have said all of that is totally and completely avoidable by getting vaccinated. 
And remember, the COVID vaccine is free. That is something that Dr. Arwady says some people don't realize or they don't trust, but it is free. Chicago is sending teams door to door in some pockets of the city. So like Englewood, where there are particularly low COVID vaccination rates, but Things are changing when it comes to vaccinations. Thursday, the last day for that mass vac site at the United Center. Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thank you. And now to Phil Ponce and the members of the Chicago City Council in advance of tomorrow's council meeting. Phil. Brandis, City Council members are expected to vote on a proposal to rename Lakeshore Drive after Chicago's first non-Indigenous settler, John Baptiste Pointe Sambo. This comes after a parliamentary maneuver delayed the vote last month. Joining us to discuss that and other City Council business are Alderperson Scott Wagusback, who represents the 32nd Ward on the north side. Alderperson Jason Irvin, who represents the 28th Ward on the west side. Alderperson Sophia King, who represents the 4th Ward on the south side. And Alderperson Carlos Ramirez Rosa, who represents the 35th Ward on the northwest side. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the uh, uh, proposal to rename Lakeshore Drive. Uh, Alderman King, you're a co-sponsor of the bill. Do you have enough votes for it to go through? Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, yes, uh, we do have enough votes for it to go through. I think that's why there's all the, uh, you know, uh, throwing out of different options out there. Uh, but yes, we, we have the votes to go through and we uh, plan on moving forward with uh, Dusable Drive. Uh, Alderman Irvin, do you share, uh, Alder, Alderperson Irving, do you share Alderperson Sophia King's optimism that the votes are there? Well, I, I do believe that the votes are there to pass uh, the uh, renaming uh, for DuSable Drive. Uh, again, I think it's a broad support across the city. Um, there are some individuals uh, who may not want to see that done. But overall, I think it's a, a positive a way to uh, rename the drive for our founding and our settler, as well as other item, items that have been placed on the table uh, by Mayor Lightfoot. Well, let's stick, let's stick with that, uh, uh, um, Alderman uh, um, Wagusback. Uh, what are your thoughts on the measure? How do you plan to vote on the uh, on DuSable Drive? Well, I think it definitely has the votes. Um, you know, I was a little uh, upset at the way we went about it. Um, some of the meetings became very contentious, and I think there were a lot of barbs thrown that didn't need to be. Um, and I, I think that upset a lot of people, but I think a lot of people have come around. Um, you know, I've looked at it. I don't think I've had any constituents who said that they were in favor of it. But, um, you know, I think when we look at it tomorrow, it's uh, definitely going to pass. And will you be, uh, but will you be voting for it personally? You know, I've, I've leaned in favor of it. But again, you know, I've, I'm trying to look back at how we went about this and, you know, reconcile what happened in some of those public meetings. Um, and the way things have gone uh, through those. But I think, you know, looking favorably about how we should move forward, I think I could probably vote for it. Uh, let's switch gears. Alderman Ramirez Rosa, community organizers and some older persons are pushing for the mayor to adopt a progressive plan for federal COVID relief money. How would you like to see that money spent? You know, the city of Chicago is in line to receive about $1.9 billion from the American Rescue Plan. So community organizations, labor organizations, and a group of aldermen came together to propose the Chicago Rescue Plan today that will be formally submitted to the city council tomorrow. It allocates money to address things like homelessness. During this pandemic, we've seen other cities use their federal dollars to get people into housing. We've seen homelessness explode across the city of Chicago during this crisis. It does things like help people stay in their homes. We know that more people have applied for rental assistance than the funds that we have available to dole out at this time. So we clearly have to raise that. It also does things like provide money for childcare, which we know is so critically important in this moment. This pandemic really exposed that so many working families need that support. And it does things like ensure that there's money for violence prevention. So I think it's a great plan. I think it's a starting point. I think the aldermen that introduced the Chicago Rescue Plan today alongside community groups are going to want to continue to interface with our colleagues here. I'm glad that we have the support of Alderwoman King, who's part of this panel tonight, and I hope that we can continue to grow the support that exists out there. The city council needs to be leading. There's no reason why we from the council floor cannot put forward our own plan uh, as to how this uh, $1.9 should be spent.
Uh, since you raised the topic of rent relief, uh, our statistics show that uh, nearly 27,000 Chicagoans applied for rental relief assistance from the city, requesting about $137 million in grants. But city officials have only about $80 million available this round. Oliver King, is there a looming housing crisis? Uh, d definitely. I mean, the pandemic has shown us uh, that, you know, housing insecurity has only gone up. Um, I agree with my colleague that, you know, we've got $1.9 billion. We need to put it to use now, really, and not wait until budget time. But to put it to use now, I think housing insecurity is, is one of the things. Uh, reparations is something we need to talk about. Uh, I think there are a numerous things that we need to do, but housing certainly is up there um, at the top of the list uh, because we not only have folks who have issues with, um, you know, rent, rent, uh, uh, the moratorium will be lifted, so we'll even have more folks who are dealing with housing insecurities. We have our homeless population, um, but there are a number of things we have to deal with, and that's certainly at the top of the list. Alderman Irvin, uh, moving along, a sweeping package that the mayor uh, hopes will help businesses recover from the pandemic will be, will be voted on tomorrow, including a ban on the sale of alcohol uh, at stores after midnight. Uh, that a good uh, that a good move? Is that a good idea? Well, I, I think that there was definitely a cry from the community about making some adjustments uh, to liquor sales uh, after you know one and two o'clock in the morning. Um, I think that the compromise that was reached was actually a good compromise. Uh, one component of it. Uh, that I, we always need to be mindful of is what is happening around our borders. Uh, as I saw on the west side of Chicago, when we had our uh, curfew for liquor at nine, people simply were just crossing over into Cicero and to Berwyn to purchase their liquor. And so part of it is, you know, we have a safety concern. And we also have a revenue concern. And I don't think that it makes sense for us to continue to lose revenue to suburban communities at a time when we des desperately utilize the revenue. So I think the compromise that was reached for midnight, I think, is actually in the best interest of all parties. Uh, Alderman Wagnersback, the package also includes changes on how the city approves permits for signs. Why is this a big deal? Well, it's, it's a big deal for a lot of uh, businesses out there who sometimes have to wait a couple months or even longer if there's delays of any kind. Uh, this would basically expedite the process, cut off a few weeks of um, waiting and get those, allow them to get the signs up a lot quicker so that they can really just draw more people in. Uh, the, the ordinance actually has a lot of great things in it that are pro-business that a lot of aldermen, even on this panel, have been asking for for many years. You know, the A-frame signs, those are the sandwich signs out there that uh, SBAC, Illinois, and the Restaurant Association have been asking for for many years. We're finally seeing that come to fruition. And we've also got delivery fees capped for a little bit longer from companies like DoorDash who've been gouging restaurants and customers. So there's a lot of great things in this package. Um, and as Alderman Urban said, there was good compromise, I think, on the closure period for the packaged good licenses. But overall, it's, it's really going to be helpful to businesses. But do you have any concerns about it or are you good with it the way it is? No, I think the I think it, I'm good with the way it is. Um, a lot of the aldermen who had issues with these late night package licensees, you know, we all have problems with uh, one or two bars or restaurants in our ward that we try to really, uh, you know, make safe and, and address the quality of life issues. And that uh, 12 o'clock period, I think, helps do that for many of the aldermen who were having issues with it. Uh, Alderman Ramirez Rosa, let's go back to housing for just a second because uh, one of the things that uh, there is a, an eviction moratorium in place. Is the city prepared to handle the situation when that moratorium goes away? You know, I don't think the courts, I don't think the city, I don't think the sheriff's office is ready to deal with the crisis that is looming ahead of us. You know, the city of Chicago allocated $80 million in emergency rental assistance. And I believe it's about $130 million that Chicagoans requested. And I'm sure there's many Chicagoans that would like to be able to request it, but weren't able to, you know, get in during the application window. So I think this is why we need to look at using the American Rescue Plan money to make sure that every single Chicagoan who's behind on their rent as a result of this pandemic has the ability to catch up, has the ability to get that assistance, 
That's why this American Rescue Plan money was put together by Democrats and by Biden to help American families. So I'm hopeful that we can continue to work with our partners at the state, county, and city to make sure that we are really working to keep people in their homes. The other aspect that we have to recognize here is that a lot of landlords will look very, um, uh, will, are very unlikely to rent to people who have an eviction on their record. So the more evictions that they are, the more landlords are actually going to be hurting themselves in a sense, because that means that there are fewer people that the market is willing to deal with. So I think we all need to come together, landlords, government, renters that have fallen behind. The dollars are there from the American uh, federal government to assist with this crisis, and we need to put them to use. And that's One what we'll have to we leave it for need now. To think but... about, though, uh, with this, and excuse me, but we... You have to look at some of our, our small landlords. Uh, I live in a ward that's pre predominantly two and three flat, and we have a lot of our, our you know, older sen senior citizens who have individuals that can't pay but won't pay. I think we have to figure out a way to deal with those individuals who are basically cheating the system uh, and won't participate and won't do what they've been asked to do, and they clearly, and they clearly can, because we do have some homeowners who are also struggling in this, and so we have to make sure that the approach we choose is balanced. Interesting perspective, and that's where we'll have to leave it for now, but we'll be joined again by the Alder people later in the program to discuss civilian oversight of the Chicago Police Department. For now, our thanks to Alder people Scott Wagusback, Jason Irvin, Sophia King, and Carlos Ramirez Rosa. And now, Bradis, we toss it back to you. Phil, thank you. After record floods in 2019, Northern Illinois is now experiencing a severe drought, the likes of which have not been seen in more than 30 years. According to state data, this spring was the third driest on record, and those records go all the way back to 1871. That means the soil is drying out, and without significant rainfall going forward, some farmers could begin to lose crops. Joining us now to share their insights on how the drought is impacting farmers are Mark Tuttle, a farmer in Samanoc in DeKalb County, and the Illinois Farm Bureau Director for District 1 in Northern Illinois. And Mike Von Bergen, a farmer in Hebron in McHenry County, who grows everything from soybeans to pumpkins to sunflowers. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. So, Mark Tuttle, let's start with you, please. How severe is this drought? What's the impact been so far? We've had a couple rains in the last, uh, this weekend, and before that we were a month without a rain. And so we've been very, very dry through all of spring. Uh, one of the impacts was we were able to get timely planted this year. We've been coming up the three wettest Mays on record. So we were able to get in the field in April, which was nice. That's kind of a normal time period for a change. But since then, we've just barely been getting enough rains to keep the crop stable and we've been using up our subsoil moisture and I'm very concerned about going into July and August. We're at a seven, maybe nine inch deficit here in Northeast Illinois. And if we don't get some subsoil moisture pretty soon, the crop is going to really have a tough time in July and August. Which crops would you say are most vulnerable to drought? Well, going into July, corn is going to be needing about an inch to two inches per week. And we're only about two weeks away from pollination, which is a very critical time. So July would be a corn issue and August will be a soybean drought issue. Soybeans will hang on through the dry weather, but when we get into reproduction time of soybeans, which is generally around the first part of August, they'll need sufficient moisture or they will not set pots. Mike Von Bergen, um, you have a very diverse range of crops, as we've mentioned. Has that enabled you to sort of, I hate to use this word, weather this drought better than uh, some farmers may be able to? We've been able to do all right. Everything that Mark said, I'd, I'd, you know, go along with that. Um, you know, we have a lot more uh, corn and soybean acres uh, than we do vegetables, but the vegetables are a high dollar crop and they require, you know, ample amount of water too to uh, make them uh, produce. So with the vegetables, we're able to do irrigation on, but irrigation isn't the same as getting rain. So there's a lot, lot more nutrients in the rainwater than there is out of a, a well water uh, that you're putting on your uh, crops or watering. And what are the challenges with irrigation? Can you can you make up for the lack of rain with irrigation? No, it's just usually enough to keep things alive and moving along, but it's, it's a lot of work. Um, you know, we have overhead, which is easy to do a uh, sprinkler, a center pivot, but then the uh, trickle that we do a lot on our plastic, that requires 
you know, working with uh, pipe and water and hauling water. So you just eat up a lot of time doing that when you could be doing a lot of other things on the farm. And Mark, you know, if crops are lost uh, to the drought, will that immediately be felt by consumers uh, in the form of higher prices? We've had higher prices all spring already because of what we've been going through. Um, we came off of two years of reduced crops. In 2019, we had prevent plant acres and raise much. In 2020, we had, it started getting dry really last July. So our crop production in the last part of 2020 was not what it should have been. I think the consumers have already seen some of the price increases. Um, right now, the shelves are kind of empty. Uh, you can see a lot of the local bids for corn are, are above what the Board of Trade is right now because they're hunting for corn right now and they're hunting for soybeans. New crop prices are at probably seven, eight year highs. So some of that's built into the market now, but it will be passed along to consumers and some of it's probably already being sold. And you mentioned 2020. Mike, I want to go over to you. How did the pandemic affect your farm last year? For us in the vegetable and agritainment, it was the best year we'd ever had. Uh, it, it did well. But also to add something to what Mark said is that our costs as farmers are, of our inputs have gone up along with all the rise in, in costs on uh, what we're getting for our crop too. So it's kind of a hand in hand. Um, we're, we're not making any more money. Uh, we're just changing dollars over. Mark, um, how would you say uh, the pandemic affected, you know, most farmers? Um, and, you know, was there much federal, ass federal assistance to, to help them out? Yeah, so farmers were affected in a couple of different ways. One, the livestock farmers probably felt it first. Um, back when the pandemic hit the uh, meat processing facilities, a lot of the workers had to go out sick and uh, they shut down meat packing for sometimes two weeks in some of the plants. So hogs and cattle slaughter got backed up. That affected the livestock guys more than anything. It affected the dairy producers. Some of the dairies couldn't take the milk right away. Corn and soybeans affected them down the road. They kind of caught on part of it because it backed up things as far as just um, delivering grains. Um, it, it affected everybody in one way or another, but I'd say the livestock more than anything. And the federal government stepped up and they provided for the losses. Uh, the CFAP program that came out under the Trump administration did help uh, maintain the farms, but it was not what you call a income producing situation was just kind of making up for some of the losses. Mark, it sounds like, you know, between the pandemic and now this drought, and you, we talked a little bit earlier uh, about higher prices to the consumer, that these two um, events would compound each other to sort of make for higher prices for consumers, as you mentioned earlier, significantly higher. Weather is always important to farmers. Weather is way too wet, way too cold. Um, now we're way too dry, coming off of three really wet years. So the weather has been a really, really tough situation for agriculture. Pandemic, throw that in on top of it. And yes, it's been kind of a chaos situation. And like I say, the crop's holding on right now, but weather and rainfall going forward is going to be very, very important. Mike von Bergen, you know, uh, just a couple of years ago, floods put some farmers on the brink of bankruptcy, and it sounds like you've been able to diversify, and um, you've been able to do pretty well uh, in these last couple of years, uh, despite, you know, the tough times that are befalling some of uh, some other farmers. How would you assess the current, current economics of, of farming? Sounds like it's a good time to be a farmer? It's always a good time to be a farmer. Um, you know, there's always something to do. You have so many different jobs. Uh, it's never boring. Um, it seems to interest my my kids are all on the younger and uh, uh, you know they're come back to the farm and working on here. Um, so yeah, I mean we enjoy it. Um, it's it's a lot different climate than what it used to be when I started farming. Uh, you know more technology, um, just even the seed changes. Mark go back to 1988 uh, and 2012. Um, the crops and the genetics are so much better than they were in 88 um, to be able to weather this dry climate. Okay, um, well, and we'll have to leave it there. Keep up the good work uh, to you, uh, Mike Von Bergen and Mark Settle. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, paying tribute to the oldest African-American art center in the country. Please stay with us.
And there's so much more ahead on the program, including why four Tribune columnists are taking buyouts from the paper's new owner. But first, marking time. That's how interdisciplinary artist Fahim Majid describes his latest tribute to the oldest African-American art center in the country. Arts correspondent Angel Ido shares more about how Majid is using graphite to mark the past, present, and future of the Southside Community Arts Center. It highlights the gallery. I just want to show people what I see when I come into that space. For the past eight decades, the Southside Community Art Center has worked to serve black creatives of all mediums. Its impact is one of the many reasons artist Fahim Majid is honoring the center in his latest project, a graphite rubbing of the entire building. I don't see old wooden walls, I see like the ancestors kind of moving through the space. So really the graphite rubbing in the exterior is one of many kind of explorations of the history of the space. For six days, Majid and his team laid sheets across the building and used graphite to literally catch the moments in time. And I had explained to them kind of how it works. Like, it's going to move on you. I mean, it's incredibly heavy. We had to do it in strips. The wind's going to blow. Like, it's going to get in your face and you move left to right. And it, by the time you come back, it's moved. But that's the point. It's kind of like trying to mark a second. It's trying to do a rubbing of a moment. When you see the piece, it doesn't look like a one for one. It is kind of like marking time. Like, I almost think of like photographs, um, but it's moving. Now, Majid used the drawing material to document the inside of the center as well, creating a collection of interior rubbings ranging from the floors to the piano to the walls. Now, the graphite tribute stands on display at the Hyde Park Art Center as a way to bridge the gap between the two institutions and ideally propel the Southside Community Art Center to the level Majid believes it should be recognized. They both came out that kind of had relationships with the Work Projects Administration, WPA, and they got government funding, like to create find a space to support community and their neighboring communities, right? So a lot of the artists that show here have shown at High Park Arts and back and forth, but there haven't really been many formal exchanges. Long term, Majid hopes this multi-layered exhibition helps people understand the role physical institutions play in not only shaping artists, but shaping communities. It doesn't look like a building because the thing kind of unravels and you go, how do you wrap a column and do a rubbing and how do you do all that stuff? So um, it's kind of an explosive kind of thing and it moves. So one column will turn into three. And I think that's a really great analogy for thinking of working in a cultural space like this, in that it's always moving and changing. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. And the full graphite rubbing is now on display at the Hyde Park Art Center until July 24th. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, a plan to create a civilian oversight board for the Chicago Police Department stalls in committee. Four older people weigh in on that and other city business. Dozens of Chicago Tribune employees are taking buyouts offered by its new hedge fund owner. We talk with four columnists leaving the paper. How big a mess are you leaving that other people are going to have to clean up? Um, and as Phil Ponce gets ready to exit the Chicago Tonight stage, a look back at his memorable conversation with Rod Blagojevich. But first, some more of today's top stories. Chicago expands its program offering free high-speed internet to students. Chicago Connected was aimed at bridging the gap for remote learners and CPS who needed internet access. Originally just for CPS students, city officials announced today that graduating seniors will have their access extended through October. And if seniors enroll in city colleges, they'll get free internet for up to three years. We have more of this story on our website. A proposed CPS policy aims at ending the school to prison pipeline. Under the new guidelines, school administrators are asked to focus on de-escalation rather than calling police in non-emergency situations, such as to remove a disruptive student. Arrests on school grounds are discouraged and students under arrest are to be accompanied by someone from the school. The new policy also removes, quote, criminalizing language from the student code of conduct. The Board of Education is set to vote on the changes tomorrow. There are more details of that proposal on our website. A youth-organized march this afternoon called out city leaders and elected officials 
for not solving cases of young black women who've been killed or gone missing. Organizers of the fourth annual We March for Her say the mayor, state's attorney, police department, and other officials aren't doing enough to solve the cases of dozens of mostly black women over the last 20 years. We want change. We want transparency from the Chicago Police Department. We want transparency from the detectives that are put on these cases because usually when these women go missing, we only hear something and then after that, you don't hear anything. And then the codes just magically close. How is the case closed if we don't know this person is found or if they have been murdered or what happened to them? And now to Phil Ponce for more on what we might expect at tomorrow's city council meeting. Phil. Thank you, Brandis. Earlier in the program, we discussed the push to rename Lakeshore Drive. Now we're joined once again by Alder People Scott Wagusback, Jason Irvin, Sophia King, and Carlos Ramirez Rosa. Uh, last week, uh, a vote stalled on a plan to create a civilian oversight board of the Chicago Police Department. Uh, it was crafted by community groups, and there, was, there were some last minute changes. Alderman Ramirez Rosa, will you try to uh, bring the measure to the floor? Do you expect your effort to be successful tomorrow? Well, you know, uh, Chris Taliaferro, the, the chair of the Public Safety Committee, promised that there'd be a vote this month. Ultimately, we want this item to move through the Public Safety Committee. You know, over 100 plus groups who have been working diligently to pass civilian oversight have come together around this unity ordinance. This unity ordinance was born out of hard work. It was born out of compromise. The solution that is now before the Public Safety Committee, if they accept the substitute ordinance, is an ordinance that we believe has the support of the majority of the Public Safety Committee and a majority support of the City Council. It's an ordinance that reflects the platform that Mayor Lightfoot ran on to ensure that we have civilian oversight uh, and that we have a meaningful representative body uh, that has the tools at their disposal to really change policing and reform this broken system. So I'm hopeful that, you know, Chris Taliaferro will do the right thing, will reconvene the Public Safety Committee in the very near future so that we can accept that ordinance uh, and so that we can have a vote on it. Uh, we've amended the ordinance to gain even more support in the Chicago City Council, and I'm hopeful that Chairman Taliaferro will now do the right thing. Alder Person Sophia King, how do you see it? Uh, there have been competing, competing proposals from different groups. The mayor obviously has her own thoughts on it. Uh, what do you think is going to happen? Oh, I, I think it's, honestly, I think we have the votes to move this forward as well. I think, um, but more importantly, that this is a bill that, uh, you know, takes everybody's uh, hard work, especially CPAC and GAPA, into consideration. Uh, it's really the people's bill, uh, where people have been working on this for a long time to really come together to talk about uh, civilian oversight. And it's, it's long overdue. I think people uh, uh, in our city uh, probably want this more than anything. And I think uh, it's time for us as city government to heed what the people want. Um, you know, it's time for us to come together and it's imperative that the mayor, that my colleagues come together and move this forward. This is probably one of the most important legislations we will deal with. Uh, we, we have seen, you know, how it works without civilian oversight with Laquan McDonald, with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. You can go on and on and on. So now is the time um, to do uh, bring civilian oversight to the floor. And I, I believe we have the will of the people and the will of the city council to move it forward. Scott Wackersback, is it uh, time for police oversight? Is it going to uh, civilian oversight of police? Is it going to happen? I think it will, and I think a lot of us have been working on it for many years. You know, I was an early supporter of GAPA, um, which I think, you know, it, it pre-merger with um, with CPAC and turning it in, into ECPS was what I thought was going to be the package that would move forward um, a couple years ago. And so I was a little surprised that we haven't been able to get it uh, moving, but I think, you know, if um, Chairman Taliaferro, I'm, I'm not really sure what happened at the June uh meet the this june meeting but um you know it, it's interesting to see how the mayor's proposal has been put forward it looked a little bit more like gappa but not really the new merger which i think carlos has worked hard to kind of put together and craft a new version um there's a lot of competing interests here and i think uh overall we do have to pass something though Jason Irvin, is it possible for city officials to uh, instill trust public trust in the police department without civilian oversight. 
I think that civilian oversight is a critical component. And, and let's let's take a step back. Uh, we too are civilians, and we too have oversight ability. It's just that uh, our oversight has just not been as effective, as direct as what we would find in a civilian uh, body that would only have that specific charge. So I think that civilian oversight is is the move. Uh, that's that we see nationally is something I think that will benefit the police department and it would also give a, a group of individuals a specific charge to deal with and work with public safety issues and I think that is what the people have asked for I want to commend the Alderman Osterman uh, Alderman uh, Sawyer and Alderman Ramirez Rosa for their hard work on combining these ordinances and getting it to the point where we are today where we see that there is a definite uh, way to get this done and with the majority uh, support of the council. Well, as you know, can't violence- can't forget Alderman Hairston. My apologies. Alderman That's okay. <laughs> well, as you know, violence in Chicago, as it is across the country, continues to be an issue. And Mayor Lightfoot says the city is seeing a downward trend. Here's what she said during a news conference yesterday when asked about this weekend's past violence. The truth is, is the events uh, that you noted obviously are tragic and heartbreaking and I will address each of them but the reality is June over June so from last year to this one what we've seen is a downward trend in both homicides and shootings and if you look at where we were in January um, to where we are now we're also seeing a downward trajectory in both homicides and shootings Alderman Ramirez Rosa do you agree a downward trend in homicides and shootings you know, the data that I've seen shows that violence is actually higher than it was in previous years. However, I think we need to understand that we are experiencing uh, a once in a lifetime situation. The pandemic, of course, uh, saw a spike in violence nationwide. Um, I think we have to take this issue seriously. And as long as people are afraid to walk the streets in their neighborhoods, as long as young people are getting shot in the streets, as long as people are getting pulled out of their cars and being shot in horrific acts of violence, there's more work that we have to do as a city and as a society to address violence. So, you know, I, I think beyond the statistics, it's clear based upon the violence that we're seeing in our communities that more must be done. And that includes violence prevention, that includes the types of evidence-based strategies that we have seen reduce violence in other communities. And that's what we'll have to leave it. Our thanks to all our people, Scott Wagaspak, Jason Irvin, Sophia King, and Carlos Ramirez Rosa. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Phil, thank you. A flood of talent is exiting the Chicago Tribune after its new owner, Alden Global Capital, offered voluntary buyouts. The hedge fund is known for drastically cutting costs at the newspapers it buys. But what are the paper and its readers losing with dozens headed for the door? Here to answer that and more are Mary Schmeek, a Pulitzer Prize winner who is leaving the Tribune after 36 years. Darlene Glanton, a Pulitzer Prize finalist who joined the Tribune Company in 1989 after working at the Los Angeles Times. Heidi Stevens, who started as a 23-year-old intern in 1998 and got her column in 2012. And Eric Zorn, who has been a columnist at the Chicago Tribune since 1986. Uh, I'm sorry it's times like this, uh, gang, but I'm glad to have each of you here. I read all of your columns, obviously. So, um, And of course, as columnists, it means that you bring your own opinion and your own flavor to the paper. Heidi Stevens, let's start with you, please. With so many opinion writers leaving, what are uh, the paper and Chicago readers losing? Well, they're losing a connection and um, form of analysis for the news. I think that what we're learning from, you know, the outpouring of such sweet emails and tweets and Facebook comments from readers is that people want to feel like someone's in the trenches with them as they, you know, uh, um, survive a, a pandemic and all the things that we just went through for the past year and the past decades. Um, you know, people feel like, these voices are not only making sense of the news for them um, and adding sort of their their um, perspective to the news, but also they're they're living through it with them. And so, um, you know, that a little bit of that goes away when the four of us leave and the other opinion writers leave. Um, but certainly, there's ample ample talent staying at the newsroom as well um, to help people make sense of everything that's swirling around them <laughs> in in every different way and eric zorn are you concerned about the direction of the news business right now 
the direction of the news business, absolutely I am. Yes, it's a, it's a difficult time for, for newspapers. And uh, it's it, it, we see this going on in, in Chicago right now with the kind of cost cutting that the Tribune is undergoing. So uh, anytime you're losing the kind of personnel that we're losing, and it's not just the columnists, we're losing uh, editors, we're losing uh, other reporters. And so you have a smaller product, you have fewer guardians at the gate and, and fewer people who are, who are taking care of the public's right to know. And so I, I do worry about that, yes. Mary Schmeek, is opinion a necessity uh, at a newspaper or is it an extra? Well, I actually don't think it's a necessity, but I do think it's one really significant way that traditionally newspapers have engaged people. And I also think that, you know, when you hear the word columnist, you always think opinion, opinion, opinion. And some of us have had a philosophy that it's also about storytelling and that stories are in their way a subtler form of opinion. So on the one hand, I mean, honestly, I've been questioning lately too. It's like, what is the role of opinion in a newspaper? And if newspapers are gonna survive, if they're gonna cut, you know, do they cut opinion? I think it's valuable, but um, I think it's a legitimate question, frankly. Darlene Glanton, uh, you know, the, the we're hearing, and it was reported in the Trib today, that the number of folks who are leaving is uh, around 40. We just heard uh, Eric Zorn say it's not just columnists, uh, but also, you know, editors and reporters. Um, what are your concerns? So what we have seen every time there is a staff reduction at the Tribune, and we've been going through this for more than a decade, right, is that certain things are left uncovered. And that is my biggest concern. I am certain that the reporters who are left will do their best um, with whatever resources they, they have to cover the city um, as thoroughly as possible. But if you don't have people, there are going to be some areas that are lacking. And that is my greatest concern. There will be stories that won't be told. There will be stories that won't be reported. Um, and I think that that is, is, is the detriment to our city. Eric Zorn, you wrote, quote, my sense is that I'm not in the long-term plans of our new owners and that I should see the offer not as a shove out the door, but as a launching pad for new adventures, new projects, and new beginnings of all sorts. Um, what is it, Eric, that gives you the sense uh, that you reference about the new owners? Is there something that you believe they may have said or that you all know that made, you know, somewhere around 40 people decide to, to take this option? Well, Alden Global Capital has been buying up newspapers for more than a decade now. And one of the things that I did once they got control of the Tribune and our sister newspapers was to look at the role that opinion columnists like myself play at those papers. And in looking at, at that, looking at what those papers had to offer in that way, I, I, I came to the conclusion that there really wasn't going to be a place for someone like me at this paper going forward in the long run. And that this offer that they gave to us to to uh, to leave the paper under fairly favorable financial terms was really an, another opportunity. That, that that a column is itself an opportunity, but that this is an opportunity for me uh, to to explore some other writing projects, some other musical projects, maybe just any other things to do. So so it was really a look at what this company has done around the country and how I felt like people like me will fit in. I, I do think that other of our younger staffers uh, will definitely have a place there. And I agree with the panel that there are gonna be some tough stories and some great aggressive reporting that's gonna keep going at the Tribune. It's not, the paper is not, is not dying. It's just really changing its, its look. Absolutely. Um, Heidi, you know, as a columnist, you develop a, a special relationship with your readers, um, especially because uh, many of your columns, you know, you're writing about personal parts of your life in Balancing Acts, the name of your column. Um, you write about your kids and, you know, your divorce, your life in general. Does, does taking the buyout feel a bit like a divorce? That's such a good question, and it honestly does a little bit, um, especially the part that is heartbreaking, but also there's some certainty that it's the right thing to do. 
Um, one analogy I use a lot because my um, parents are big nature lovers is like a controlled burn, right? When you, you go in and you intentionally set something on fire and you sort of leave everything, you know, charred and ashen, but, you know, growth um, is able to come through um, because of that change. And certainly not implying that I'm leaving the newsroom <laughs> charred and ashen because it's filled with, as I said earlier, tons and tons of talent. But but when you're making a decision for your own life to, um, you know, to leave something behind um, that you love or to, um, you know, um, cut ties uh, when, um, when you know that it's time, even if it's painful, um, it is a bit like a, like a divorce. Uh, Mary, you won a Pulitzer Prize in 2012. Looking back on your years at the Trib, what were some of the other highs? Oh, you know, there've been so many highs, but honestly, I don't like to dwell on those because I, I fear sometimes that we have a romance about, you know, the newspaper of yore. And the truth is, I think we all just have to get our head into the space of this is the world we are living in now. This is the financial reality, not just of the Chicago Tribune, but of newspapers all over. So, you know, even though I have loved my 40 years in the newspaper business, and my 30, however many it is, at the Chicago Tribune. I really don't like to romanticize what those years were. They were great, they're gone. Now the Tribune and the city needs to figure out, okay, what's gonna happen next? And hopefully if there's time, we're gonna come back to what is next for some of you. Darlene, though, you've held several positions at the Tribune. What was special about your time there? I think for me, it has been the opportunity to tell stories and to try to help people walk in the shoes of um, a population that they really didn't understand or didn't know. Um, if, I, if I have done anything that I hope will have a lasting impact, it, I hope that is it is that um, people have opened their minds to think about things in a different way and to be committed to um, fixing some of the problems that we have to deal with in this city. And in, in the 60 seconds we've got left, I'm gonna try and ask this of each of you. Um, I know it's early yet, Darlene, what, what is next for you? I'm gonna take two months to relax and enjoy, and then I'll figure it out. <laughs> That's a good plan. Mary Schmeek. I'm going to go see some family that I have not seen since the pandemic started. Oh, Eric. I'm going to learn a bunch more fiddle tunes. That's my summer plan. <laughs> um, and, and Heidi, what about you? What's, what are you thinking? <laughs> Um, I'm actually going to do uh, some contract work for uh, University of Chicago for a uh, doctor and author there named Dana Suskind, who's doing some really exciting work around um, parenting and, and turning America into a more parent-friendly nation. So um, when we have more than 60 seconds, I'll talk more about it, but <laughs> that's my path next. We have, had, we have had Dana Suskind on the show before, so I look forward to hearing more about yeah, that. She's best, awesome. of, <laughs> best of luck to each of you, and thanks to all of you uh, for joining us and looking forward to hearing from you all further down the road. Heidi Stevens, Darlene Glanton, Mary Schmeek, and Eric Zorn. Thanks so much. Thanks, Brandon. Thank, Thank you. Up next, as Phil Ponce winds up his time here on Chicago Tonight, at the end of the month, we begin a series of Ponce moments. But first, a look at the weather. As we mentioned on the program last week, Phil Ponce, who started working here at Chicago Tonight in 1992, will be retiring at the end of this month. Beginning tonight, we'll be looking back at some of our favorite Ponce moments. Here's some highlights from Phil's memorable conversation with then-Governor Rod Blagojevich in 2005.
Uh, notwithstanding everything you've done, say you know, you've done in terms of what you've had available to you, you've done A plus, but but the disparities exist and they yeah. continue to exist, and and they're going to continue to exist until somebody does it, makes a fundamental change in the way schools are funded, whether it's a tax swap or whatever. Earlier in the year, you talked about the importance of testicular virility. Uh, shouldn't you use it to do something once and for all to fix uh, the funding uh, setup in Illinois? Well. I, I, I think we're making progress, and I think part of this process requires getting the confidence of the people back who pay for all of this. And again, I think it's wrong to ask the taxpayers to pay more, pay, pay more and more out of their pockets, the hard-earned money that they earn, until less than until they see that government is going to be responsible to them. Another area of concern is how you have been balancing budgets, and the rap against you is that you've been simply passing on the state's fiscal problems onto future generations by borrowing money to to deal with current deficits. For example, this year's budget, what, sure changes the state's employee pension by uh, fund by more than a billion dollars. How big a mess are you leaving that other people are going to have to clean up? Um, we are, I think, in a position where our fiscal house is in order. Uh, Governor, as you know, an ongoing federal investigation has resulted in a guilty plea from a big-time Democratic fundraiser, Joseph Carey, whose testimony connects public official aid to an alleged illegal plot to trade lucrative state pension business for campaign cash. I'm reading it just to make sure I get it straight. Uh, you were asked about it a few weeks ago. For the record, do you deny that you are public official A? I, com I completely and wholeheartedly deny that any kind of activity, as was indicated in that, is something that we do. We don't operate that way. I wouldn't tolerate that kind of behavior, not for a single second. And the rest is history. Phil Ponce and Rob Blagojevich on Chicago Tonight back in 2005. Tomorrow, we go back to 2007 to see Phil talk with another PBS star, his very personal conversation with Elmo. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. As city council meets, will older people reconsider a plan to put an elected board of residents in charge of the Chicago Police Department? And exploring the city's colorful history of cartooning at the Museum of Contemporary Art. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.